So it all starts with a good woman. It all starts with a good woman. John Marston is the luckiest man alive. Arthur told me that a long time ago. <laughs> it all starts with a good woman. I think about this line frequently as it's one of the few times that Uncle is able to take on a more serious tone and say something that genuinely borders on almost profound. There are many notable women throughout the Red Dead franchise, Bonnie McFarlane, Luisa Fortuna, uh, Sister Calderon, Sadie Adler, and the list goes on. Though there is one specific woman that I find myself describing as the backbone of the duology and that would be Abigail Roberts Marston. Her presence is so deeply influential throughout both games that it really can't be understated. She and her son become the entire motivation for John Marston and Arthur Morgan alike, as even Arthur sees the value in preserving what they have, something that he's lost. John Marston is the luckiest man alive because he's fallen for someone who innately understands who he is and who he can become. A woman in far less ideal circumstances than the one that Arthur Morgan fell for which means she's far more likely to stick it out when things get tough. We get to see John at three different stages of his life. An outlaw, a domesticated outlaw, and whatever you want to call the in-between. Whereas we only ever see Arthur at one. He never really reaches domesticity, and he passes away two years younger than John would be at his oldest age. Despite this, we see comparable upbringings, similar challenges and motivations. In fact, they even share a motivation, Abigail. Arthur, interestingly, is never really founded in himself to prioritize his own love life. Instead, he seems to see it as a fruitless cause and shifts course to something a little more attainable. I feel like I'm Charlie Kelly in that one scene from Always Sunny, of which I don't watch, but everyone knows the scene. Take a look at this! Jesus Christ, Charlie. That right there is the mail. Now let's talk about the mail. Can we talk about the mail, please, Mac? I'm dying to talk about the mail with you all day, okay? But listen, please hear me out. Let me talk about how these characters overlap and align and contrast, okay? Also, you may have noticed we're in another new location, and I've been Jack Marstoning you all for four videos, but I assure you, we're staying put, okay? We're in our Beecher's Hope era, all right? Now, I am an unabashed Abigail Marston lover, so this will undoubtedly read like a love letter to her. Sorry, John Marston, I'm moving in on your girl. But on a genuine note, I think she's a great character, very influential to the story, and I'll get into that, but I just think she's deserving of a bit of love sometimes. She gets a lot of unwarranted criticism in my experience, so... Anyway, though we can't talk about Abigail without talking about John, and we can't talk about John without talking about Arthur, and I can't talk about Arthur without talking about Mary, so indulge me if you will. And as I've been obsessively thinking about them in a very normal and healthy manner, um, I've started to connect some dots. You didn't connect shit, but I've connected them. Abigail, John, Arthur, and Mary are all raised under somewhat similar circumstances, all of them having at least one dead parent, only one of them having a living parent, and he calls her a damn nuisance and then threatens to kill her, so... <sighs> Although this doesn't sound too far off from the descriptions we get of Arthur's father, or even John's in some circumstances. We know very little about Abigail's parents other than, like John and Arthur's, they're dead. Their relationships, or lack thereof, with their parents and the subsequent fallout of that weaves its way into their characterization, their life choices, and their motivations. It's what pushes Arthur and Mary together, but also what keeps them apart and it's also what puts Abigail in the position to wind up pregnant and biologically tied to John Marston for life. Their son and the potential of their family grounds Abigail's character, John's perspective, and is reminiscent of what Arthur once had, effectively making it his core motivation. He sees himself in John, in his 20s and hapless, and so willing to turn his back on something that Arthur's already lost. It's something that he carries so much guilt and grief over that it becomes paramount in motivating his fight, as he's literally dying preserving what he's lost, even as he's offered an opportunity at having it again. Before Arthur even knows it's too late, he can't leave Abigail and Jack behind, and he can't leave John to make the same mistakes that he's made, so he refuses Mary when she offers to run away with him, because he can't let it happen again. In Jack, he sees what he missed. Listen, I was using a ring light for my first few videos, and so I didn't have a viewfinder out, and now I do, and it's really hard not to look at myself. So bear with me, I don't want to record a bunch of lines because I just caught myself looking in the viewfinder. We're just gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> I'm doing it again! Like I said in my last video about Jack, he finds himself at the center of the story. 
But of course, there is no Jack without Abigail. Abigail Marston, previously Roberts, was born in 1877. We don't really know much about her past other than she was making a living as a working girl in dive bars and brothels until 1894 when she would be introduced to the Vanderling gang, only a year before Jack was born. She was introduced via uncle who was rather famous for picking up passengers. In 1895, Jack's birth year, Abigail would have only been 18 years old. That means when she was introduced in 1894, she would have been no older than 17, and there's a possibility, due to the fact that we don't know these exact dates, that she could have been 16. If Abigail becomes pregnant and subsequently quits working, this means that when Dutch makes rather imaginative claims about him and others in the gang all having her, He's talking about a 17-year-old girl. This was actually pretty common for the industry that Abigail worked in, as young, naive girls would frequently be lured into the industry. I am also very aware that this is a rather new conversation about whether or not it's weird or immoral for grown adults to be attracted to or sleep with teenagers. The industry and general society placed and still continues to place value on the youth of women and girls Oftentimes, women who age past their early 20s unmarried are called spinsters or past their prime. Considering Abigail is only 17 when she joins the gang, this implies that for the majority of her career, or all of it, she was a minor. By today's law, anyway, I understand that back in the day it was totally chill. Because Abigail is an orphan, she likely had no financial security. She's also illiterate, and this suggests that either her parents died very young, or they did not see value in her education, as was common. Of course, her lack of education would limit her access to society, but so would the fact that she's a girl in 19th century United States. This is what sets Abigail apart from Mary. Access or the lack thereof. During this period, the working girl industry would have been very influential in the lucrative success of many major cities, with it being a leading economic sector by the mid-century. Though between the mid-1850s and 1910, when it would eventually become outlawed, it would experience many major shifts. This industry opened up a small degree of financial freedom for all kinds of disadvantaged women. Many of them were racialized or previously enslaved. There were widows and orphans like Abigail, and it was not uncommon to find girls in this line of work. Before some shifts in societal ideals, working girls had become a major draw for a lot of cities, using that appeal especially for elite clientele in brothels and parlor houses. Due to its popularity and the general public's, um, lack of cleanliness, it became a hotbed for what was known at the time as venereal diseases, or the clap. STIs more formally. To combat this, many cities would instate regulations that prevented solicitation of this sort on certain floors of a building, like New Orleans, which prevented solicitation on the first floor of an establishment. Or other places would regulate it to certain districts of a city, like Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, where many working girls would localize due to a high population of army men in the area and they would frequently be found in army groups as it was thought to keep the morale high. However, this really only seemed to raise the amount of STI transmission in the army, so... Though regulations would be put in place to combat this, that seemed somewhat punitive towards working girls in particular. Things like requiring a physical examination every two weeks, which seems like a reasonable way to combat STIs, however, Working girls would be charged an initial registration fee, and then they would have to pay for each examination. Not to mention, the areas in which this form of solicitation was often relegated to would attract a great deal of crime and violence, making their working conditions increasingly hostile. During the period that Abigail would have been active in the field, it was on a downtrend in terms of societal approval, which meant it lacked a lot of protections from clientele and the government alike and a lot of the regulations being put through would limit their rights and protections. In an attempt to cut down on the amount of women and girls that were being trafficked into and around the United States during the time, they would put through laws that would prevent working girls from crossing state lines, which would limit their already limited agency as well as their access to movement. Eventually, this would go on to change in the early 1900s. What I'm attempting to illustrate is, despite Abigail participating in what was known as legal work, it was still a very dangerous and hostile workplace environment and there were no social or legal protections put in place for her. In fact, there were many laws and regulations that would have undoubtedly made her work significantly more challenging, like making it illegal to transport lewd or lavicious materials like birth control, something I'm sure Abigail would have 
appreciated. Falling in with a gang would ensure her a certain degree of security and protection, and knowing what we do about the Vanderlyn gang, we know that there are certainly far less hospitable gangs that she could have fallen into. However, that doesn't necessarily negate the fact that there are claims that multiple members of the gang participated in her exploitation as a minor. Now, despite the fact that John would have been an adult by technicality, I think we can agree that there's a difference between John at 21, 22, soliciting 17-year-old Abigail and Dutch, who would have been nearly 40. Or uncle. <laughs> I also know that this was not considered illegal or even immoral for the time. However, this is a game set not long after the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War, wherein we were debating the morality of owning human beings. There's often this insinuation about history that people just didn't know any better, and that it was broadly accepted to just mistreat people. Though the existence of Civil War defectors or abolitionists proved to us that there were definitely people of that time who knew better and were demanding more. We can acknowledge, knowing what we do in 2023, that it's strange that Dutch, as a 40-year-old man, could have feasibly been attracted to a 17-year-old Abigail, and then for him to later throw that back in her face as a boastful statement to get under her husband's skin. Like he's not loudly and proudly saying, I slept with your wife when she was a minor! Sir? Whether he's being honest or not, it's still kind of a weirdo move, isn't it? But I get that to Dutch, it's unlikely that Abigail was seen as a teenager or a child through his eyes. Though it is perplexing to me that oftentimes this is repeated by fans as a way to malign Abigail's character, but I digress. Something I appreciate about John is his lack of held shame about it, though. John never once bats an eye at these insults and remarks, never does he seem to show any discomfort about this truth or ever use it against her which would have been entirely expected and common, especially for the time. In fact, it's a part of her that he embraces and even loves. And he ain't gonna marry no orphaned working girl running with a bunch of hucksters, neither. If he meets one like you, I hope he'll marry her. <laughs> I believe that this is in part due to the fact that, despite their communication deficits for the broad majority of the relationship, John does care for Abigail, deep down somewhere in there. And I think he also acknowledges that, like him, Abigail did what she had to do to survive. The major difference is that Abigail can say that at least it was legal work, and John killed someone by the time he was 11. Though he claims it wasn't his fault, and I believe him. <laughs> Despite their differences in priorities, which I'll get into, John and Abigail come from rather comparable upbringings, orphaned young, with John's father reportedly frequenting bars and the likes. It doesn't sound like he was much of a present parent, and it's possible that John, when he was as young as Jack is in Red Dead Redemption 2, was frequenting bars and the likes with his father, which I think we can all agree isn't the best place for a child in their formative years. By the time John is 8, he's already parentless, and then by the time he's 11, he's already on the path to violence and crime something that would be fostered by the likes of Dutch Vanderland and Hosea Matthews. Dutch and Hosea likely saved John's life in more than one way, by literally saving him from being hung as a child, but then also by giving him a fighting chance in life, the same way they did with Arthur. But in many ways it's also true that they signed his death warrant. Of course, I don't believe that Dutch and Hosea had wholly ill intent when it came to John and Arthur, and the options for an 11-year-old murder are slim to none out there. John ran away from an orphanage, a place that would have fed, clothed, and sheltered him. During the 19th century, orphanages were often described as not good. They were often regimented assimilative spaces that profited off of child labor under the guise of teaching trades. I'm really enjoying these today. Lots of, a lot of this. Ow. And while these would be useful skills for children who grew into adulthood, which many of them did not, they were still jobs that were oftentimes dangerous or even hostile, like working in factories or farms, and they usually received no compensation. Like, they actually, like, auctioned children off, by the way, like, straight up plucked children off the streets of New York, whether they had families or not, to ship across the United States in some kind of lottery-esque selection. Between the years 1854 and 1929, there were hundreds of thousands of children transported on these trains, often known as orphan trains, which you can look up if you want to do more research on this topic, really interesting. 
so awful. <laughs> Moreover, these orphanages often resembled a prison system with children being abused by both caretakers and their peers. Children were also kicked out of orphanages by the age of 14, which is still undoubtedly a child, but the spaces were usually quite overcrowded. Eventually, we'd decide that orphanages were rather detrimental to child development, with many of them leaving with antisocial behaviors or struggling on a cognitive or social level. You may notice that this in many ways resembles the American foster system, and that would be because it replaced the orphanage system in the 1920s. Am I saying that John was on an orphan train? No. I'm simply saying that the environment was undoubtedly awful, and I can see why John would run away. I can also see why Dutch and Hosea were a far superior option to John, as not only do they supply shelter, security, and meet his basic needs, but they also have a sense of community, which is something he was obviously lacking within an orphanage system. Instead of the generally hostile environment of an orphanage or the streets, John is welcomed into the Vanderlyn gang in its infancy, and this happens before he's even a teenager, which is a rather fundamental stage for development. The attachment John forms to Dutch specifically is interesting to me because even after being betrayed, abandoned, and lied to, John will still say that it broke his heart to see Dutch in 1907. And then furthermore, after being threatened and shot at, he will still struggle to put an end to things in the future. While Dutch and Hosea function as pseudo-parental figures for a few years, and they're seemingly much less neglectful to John than his biological father, it's also clear that they didn't instill him with some valuable life skills. For example, considering cause and effect, long-term thinking, taking responsibility for one's actions, and say, uh, pulling out on time. John's undeniably challenging upbringing and his lack of father figure, or rather, good father figure, means that he approaches fatherhood with a real lack of experience. John is someone that we routinely watch struggle to adjust to new expectations, especially when those expectations require experience that he doesn't really have. John lacks experience within the traditional confines of family. His family has been a collection of outlaws, all from different walks of life, but most of them without fathers. Dutch, in particular, is a man who's lost his own father, but seems to see the power and the anger of a fatherless man. And that's something I want to talk about at length in the future, but I don't have the time for that right now. But the point I'm making is that fatherhood, or parenthood in general, seems to be a very prevalent theme throughout this duology. John's struggle with parenthood seems to harken back to his lack of experience, but I think it also speaks to his experience with abandonment. Being a young orphan and running away and falling in with a transient gang, John likely learns many times over that the best way to deal with a problem is to get away from it. John has been and will continue to be abandoned throughout the series, and I imagine it might have felt like almost a reflex to do the same thing to Jack. Neither John or Abigail ask for the circumstances that are brought upon them. It's not as though contraceptives were readily available and accessible, and I'm sure given the option, neither John nor Abigail would have chosen to have children with one another, certainly not as young as they did. However, another major theme that I've been talking about a lot lately, especially where John's concerned, is consequences. The consequences of their lack of resources becomes not only Jack, but a difference in priorities where parenthood now becomes the center of Abigail's motivation, it becomes an entire arc for John. Arthur is not so different, and I think in part that's what fuels some of his resentment towards John. He's angry at John for leaving, yeah, but I think more significantly, Arthur still has this deep-held anger towards himself that he's projecting onto John for not valuing the very thing that he's lost. Arthur's watching John repeat his mistakes and follow in his footsteps, despite the fact that it's likely that John has some inkling as to what Arthur's lost. They live together, and some few offhanded comments from John imply that he's not exactly ignorant. Here he is, Father of the East. You need to take a look in the mirror. I can imagine the frustration on Arthur's part. One, he's being abandoned by someone he considers his brother, but also the reason for it is because John wants to avoid taking responsibility for his son, something that Arthur's already done and paid for. Also, I want to nip something in the bud uh, now. Is it bud or butt? I've always said bud. You t uh, um. Anyway, I understand that Abigail's past profession lends a degree of speculation to whether John was the father at all. However, I want to push back on this idea for a few reasons. On the most basic level, John taking responsibility for Jack and making an honest attempt at being an actual parent is like a very fundamental part of his arc as a character. It's also like a major facet of his own redemption arc, so 
you get it. This insinuation that it doesn't matter if Jack is biologically John's son, it matters that John took responsibility. While I understand it's a nice thought on its surface, the more I think about it, the more it just sounds like, well, technically it's okay that John treated Abigail the way he treated her. The way he treated Jack was acceptable because he had reasons to doubt. And I don't think that's fair or true, personally. I don't want to condone the way that he treated Abigail and Jack, as I think that's uh, something he had to grow from and take responsibility for. It also feels like I'm calling Abigail a liar. And you guys, I gotta tell you, the fact that Abigail is so adamant that it is John Marston, despite the fact that he wants nothing to do with her or Jack, a total deadbeat, not contributing, I don't know why she would be so adamant that it's John Marston, if it just wasn't true. If there was a chance that it could have been anyone else, I don't know why she would have taken John, you know? Not that I think many of the others would be terribly keen to step up either, but come on. She begged this man to even look at her son for four years, and he wouldn't do it until he got kidnapped. Moving on. In the least combative manner, when people tell me that Jack looks like Javier, I feel like I'm gonna short circuit. <laughs> what do you mean? In what sense? His facial hair? I'm gonna have to tell my beardless brothers about this revelation and we'll have to discuss it with my heavily bearded father. Not to mention, Jack is literally a carbon copy of his father. Not only to my eyes, but every NPC that encounters him as an adult. Uh, you, you look just like your father, Mr. Uh, Mr. Manchin, right? Oh, it can't be! Are you the same man I met on the train from Blackwater? Is that you? You look younger. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really passionate about this matter. Anyway, moving on. I also deeply resent the idea that he could be Arthur's son. I understand he wrote about Abigail in his journal, and I'll talk about that soon, don't worry. I personally don't believe that Arthur slept with Abigail. Yes, I know that we all had her. That was written before Arthur was ever a thing. There's no indication that Arthur's terribly interested in working girls or young women. But when a major facet of Arthur's characterization is being hardened by the loss of his son, it just feels a little ridiculous that he would have it out for John for the fact that he has to look after his kid when it's really been his kid the whole time. Do you... you get it. It's, it's just a frustrating idea. Do you know what? You hear what? You get it. On a narrative level, it just doesn't make sense that Jack would be anyone else's but John's. Moving on. Anyway, what was I talking about again? Oh, right, Arthur. I find I don't talk much about Arthur, even on other platforms, and the reason for that is... I guess, like, what hasn't been said, you know? Um, but I'm sure I can find something to talk at you about. <laughs> An interesting contrast he has with John is the fact that we only ever see Arthur at 36. We get to hear loosely about who he used to be and how he used to be less cold and withdrawn, but with time and trauma, that changed. It intrigues me to listen to stories about Arthur and his youth, especially from Dutch and Hosea. We can still see some of those traits and qualities within the version of Arthur that we get, in the times where he's enjoying himself or even cracking a smile. One of Arthur's greatest qualities for me is his genuine and authentic curiosity for the world around him. He, on the surface, is like any other typical Western protagonist. Like John, he's rough and tumble and he fights and shoots and he's big and he's mean and people take him seriously. But unlike John, there is this undeniable softness to him. The more you spend time with him, the more you discover he's a man who draws flowers in his journal, or has heart-to-hearts with the camp girls, or baby talks dogs, and helps strangers without cause. He still doodles hearts around the initials of the one who got away. Arthur, like John and Abigail, is also an orphan, though the descriptions of his father are even less becoming than those of John's. He was raised by a man who he watched die, and says it didn't happen soon enough, and while the memory of Lyle Morgan doesn't get much more descriptive than that, it certainly paints a picture. It sounds as though Arthur lost his mother when he was quite young, as he doesn't remember much of her, but what memories he does have sound quite pleasant. We also don't know how old he was when Lyle died, outside of it being prior to him being 14 or 15. Despite his cold words, Arthur still dons Lyle's hat and keeps a picture of him next to his bed. Like I had mentioned earlier about Dutch and his proclivity towards fatherless men, this is taken advantage of most explicitly with Arthur Morgan. Multiple times we watch Dutch take advantage of this clear desire for a father figure or paternal guidance with the very overt use of the term son under specific circumstances. Looks like I turned into the goddamn errand boy. You have turned into my son. You worry because I worry. We are just the same. I was gonna say you're like a son to me. 
But you're more than that. Now, shall we proceed? I guess. Listen, <clears throat> son. Whether to reinforce allegiances or diffuse frustration, it becomes very clear that Dutch is being calculated in his usage of this word. He sees this trait in Arthur, and he knows how to take advantage of it. Arthur was the first, the blueprint, and Dutch will attempt to replicate this exact scenario with multiple other characters, and I will talk about that in the future, but right now we must focus on Arthur. It's typical that people who experienced strained or abusive relationships with a caretaker in their life will project an idealized version of that relationship onto a role model figure in their life like your really nice English teacher. Arthur will write in his journal that he loves Hosea like a father, and it's not hard to see why, as he's much more authentic and empathetic than his outlaw counterpart, who Arthur describes as something other than human. For a while, Arthur is alone with Dutch and Hosea, and then some of the other adults that fall into the group, but after losing both of his parents and living as a homeless youth for a time, he likely comes to see these adults as saviors. Dutch saved me. Saved most of us. That's why we need to stick by him through this. Even as he becomes more self-sufficient in his adulthood, it's clear that he never really loses that initial allegiance. I also think it might go deeper than allegiance. I think it could also be dependence. Arthur's life, his outlook, his ideology have all been structured around the gang and effectively molded by Dutch and Hosea. Arthur, like John, is taken in at a vulnerable point in his life, and the value of loyalty is instilled in him young, but not just the value of loyalty in general, as learning to be loyal to what matters would be something he would have to learn later in life, when he's confronted with his own mortality. Rather, the value of loyalty to Dutch is instilled. In Dutch, there's security. He's taught to survive. He's taught to read. He's nurtured. And he receives this in an unwavering sense for two decades. I often find myself pondering the sequence of Arthur's life, wondering when and how things happened, where he was in between. I feel quite strongly that there's simply no possible way that Mary came after Eliza and Isaac. Arthur hardened by that kind of guilt and grief, I don't know, I just can't imagine himself opening himself up to another relationship, knowing the potential it now holds. But what I can imagine is a heartbroken Arthur fawning after the attention of some pretty waitress you know, something to ease the pain. A good old rebound. It also seems like Arthur Morgan-level cosmic bad luck that he would indeed end up with a child from a one-night stand, so... Based on Arthur's description of Eliza, I imagine their relationship was cordial, but I don't think it extended beyond co-parents after he had made the decision to not stick around. Arthur then seems to remain hung up on Mary Linton until the day he dies, which is so cancer man of him. Anyway, let's read his diary. He's less of a fool than he was, and maybe he can have the luck that has eluded me. For Jack is an innocent little boy. In him, I see what I missed. We don't know much about Isaac, and we don't know how old he was when he passed, but I struggle to imagine him as really any older than Jack would have been. I consider this mission from the Money Lending and Other Sins quest line, wherein Arthur goes to collect the debt from a man named Arthur, ironically, um, but discovers he died while working the mines. Miners as in people who worked in the mine and not children, um, but also they did put children in the mine. Anyway, miners often died of lung complications, no surprises there, but what's interesting is oftentimes these ailments were called black lung. Arthur, upon discovering that Arthur Londonderry has passed away, goes to collect the debt from his widow and discovers she has a young son, and it feels almost too on the nose for it to be a coincidence. He can't even bear to look at them, and I imagine he's stricken with not only the memory of Isaac and Eliza, but the future of Abigail and Jack, and the realization that he is now the man who could very well effectively take everything from them, leaving them for dead. He's become the man who took his family from him. Of course, not in like a literal sense. This is actually one of the few pieces of legal work that Arthur participates in, and yet it's the quest line that makes me feel the worst about myself, so... Arthur knows that if he collects this debt, he's leaving them with nothing, and it's all too likely they'd end up in a far worse position if not dead. He knows the cost of leaving a woman and a child without their father. He not only sees this in the momentary exchange with Arthur Londonderry's widow, 
but in Abigail and Jack as well. I oftentimes wonder what was going through Arthur's head when he reassures John that everything's gonna be okay when he knows good and well that people need far less reason to hurt a boy. Sometimes I want I don't actually, I don't wonder. I just fully believe that Arthur's stated intent in his journal to marry Abigail has far less to do with any kind of romantic feelings he had and far more to do with him projecting his grief and guilt about Eliza and Isaac onto Abigail and Jack. Maybe in his head, it feels like a way to absolve himself if he can somehow save Abigail from the fate that he couldn't save Eliza from, from the fate he's undoubtedly forced upon others. Arthur is a man who holds multitudes. On one hand, he's so motivated by loyalty and his guilt and his grief, but on the other, he oftentimes wants to fall back on this defense that it's who he is. He's this violent, uncontrollable force. He was set free to fight. Arthur is protected under this hard shell, this aloof facade that he puts up to protect his vulnerabilities. However, it's not as though we're entirely denied these vulnerabilities, much in the same way that we often are with John. There's a distinct warmth within Arthur that is oftentimes lacking in John. And it comes out in really telling ways. He seems to let his guard down around very specific people, and it's not always the people that you would expect. The relationships he's held for over a decade in some cases, like Dutch and Hosea, John, even Susan, who have seen him through multiple phases of his life. When he met and proposed to marry, uh, when that engagement inevitably fell through, when he had a family that he'd make periodic visits to for a time, and then when he stopped visiting and became the hardened man we see today. And despite the fact that they've seen him through all of this, there's a distinct lack of vulnerability within these relationships. Arthur would rather sit with Mary Beth or Tilly, even Karen, and talk about his headspace. He nearly cries in front of Sister Caldron, and he opens up in a really unexpected manner to Rain's fall. It makes sense though, I think. When you consider the way he discusses his father, a man who would have been responsible for him during his formative years, it would make sense that Arthur would have this wall put up between himself and those he considers family. Despite the distance he keeps between himself and the gang, his pseudo-family, they're still his top priority. In some instances, they're even his sole priority. Even as is hitting the fan, and it might be wise to consider, you know, cutting your losses and taking the opportunity to run off with a woman you love, Arthur is still thinking about Abigail and Jack, and John, and the others who don't really stand a fighting chance of surviving Dutch's descent into madness. Arthur and Mary, like Abigail and John, have enough in common that they seem to have made sense at one point, but they also lack enough in common that they butt heads frequently enough that it makes sense why they didn't work out in the end. Mary's so real, though. Because who amongst us didn't see this man and go, um, actually, I think I can make peace with murder. But then he's out of her life for a minute, as his life would frequently require, and she's like, wait a minute! This guy's a criminal! But he's so cute, and he has pretty eyes, and he's kind of sweet. Mary, like Arthur, lost her mother and is now stuck with a father who holds a deep disdain for his children. But at least she has one, I guess. Neither Mary nor Jamie have really anything positive to say about their father. Despite this, though, they still hold a deep respect and protectiveness over him, to the point where when Arthur says something that is likely true and honest, they both tell him to watch his mouth. This isn't uncommon for people with abusive loved ones. Uh, many of them may continue to be defensive or protective over them, despite the fact that they may even be cognizant of the fact that the way they're being treated is not right. That being said, treating your children, especially your daughters this way, was not unheard of during the era, obviously. Like Arthur, there's shame in Mary too because in many ways, Arthur's right about her. Mary holds a certain level of pride over the fact that she's not a criminal, but despite this fact, her life really isn't that much better off. She's asking, begging, for his help now. When we first hear from Mary, it's indicated that this is the first time since she went off and got married, as she said she would not contact again. She's living in a boarding house rather than a hotel, which could indicate the fact that she's been in Valentine for a while before she spotted the girls there. In this letter, Mary seems to make the assumption that who she saw were a group of working girls that live with the gang, as when she was around, the women she would have known were Susan and Abigail, and she likely doesn't know now that they don't really keep working girls. Susan seems to think lowly of Mary, stating that she had ideas above her station, 
which is something she also says about Abigail, who ironically likes Mary. I remember you used to play dominoes with Mary. Yeah, sometimes. I always liked her. Arthur and Mary described themselves as being young when they were involved. How young? Who knows? But it's likely that Mary was also young when she got married to Barry Linton, who notably also dies of a respiratory complication. I also often think that their names rhyming is a fun little callback to the statement that Hosea makes about Lenny and Jenny. Lenny and Jenny could never have worked. That's like Arthur and Martha, or Bill and Phil. Anyway, we don't know how young they were, but considering this is the 19th century and women were considered spinsters by the time they were like 23, I think it's likely that they were either in their late teens or very early 20s when they were together. Or at least Mary was. An adult by all legal recourse, however, having been 20 at one point in my life, it's a time where you're still really new to the world. You're entering a new phase with new expectations, your brain's still developing, and you're a lot more easily swayed than one might think. Mary, having been raised by a controlling, authoritarian father, likely respects but also fears his opinion. Much in the same sense, she likely found something deeply intriguing about the man that Arthur was and the way that he opposed the ideals of her father. However, in a time where you lack any real decision-making power, especially where your money and marriage are concerned, Mary stands to lose a lot by agreeing to marry Arthur. During the 19th century and well into the 20th, the United States would employ an Old English law known as coverture, wherein a woman's existence would essentially be absorbed into her husband's assets. A married woman would lose her right to own property or sign contracts or control her own funds. Women were typically denied much economic or financial freedom, with very few states giving bare-bones rights to property and funds to married women. During the 19th century, certain states had minor freedoms, like New York allowing women to sign patents, or Mississippi allowing women to own property in their own names. In many states, until the 1900s, widows, like Mary, would become responsible for their husband's debts. It's also worth remembering, like I mentioned earlier with Abigail, not many women were educated, so even though they could, in New York, sign patents, how many women were capable of doing so? The point I'm making is that there are a lot of reasons that Mary would likely reconsider her engagement to Arthur that would be more than reasonable, but I would say the major contributor to the reason that their engagement fell through was her father. Marrying Arthur would effectively cut Mary off from her father, and likely the rest of her family. And while the way he treats her would make that seem like a good thing, it's clear that there's more to consider than feelings in this scenario. Can her love for Arthur surmount the reality that marrying him means giving up everything she knows? Giving up the modicum of class privilege she has, which is hard to come by as a woman in the 19th century. It's also worth noting that I don't think that the way that they fight and bicker is necessarily isolated to the fact that their relationship fell through. Rather, I think it could have been a contributor to it. If you happen to have low honor when Mary asks Arthur for help the first time and you choose to not respond at all, Mary gets frustrated and declares Arthur hasn't changed and then goes inside. I can see you haven't changed much. Mary. If you decline, however, she is significantly more agreeable and understanding. You're gonna have to find someone else to run your errands. Okay. So it's not as though her frustration is with the fact that Arthur won't help her. It's the fact that he won't communicate. Again, this kind of speaks to the idea that Arthur is much more likely to repress his internal thoughts and feelings where those he cares most for are concerned. Arthur's lack of ability to communicate, paired with Mary's persistent indecisiveness that Arthur is frequently collateral damage in, makes it clear that they likely butt heads well before the final nail in the coffin. Mary struggles with knowing what she even wants, trapped between two rather undesirable options, and she doesn't really want either of them. Mary sees the potential in Arthur far before he sees it within himself, likely because she got to see this chivalrous, kind, down-to-earth version of Arthur that seems so at odds with this outlaw lifestyle that he's so intent on living. Arthur, like John, doesn't seem to know what he would do without this life. He's been living it for longer than he lived within society, and he's structured everything around those who saved him, just as Mary's life is structured around her father. This is where their loyalty splits, where their fathers, biological or otherwise, pull them in different directions. 
love is not enough when loyalty is in the discussion. Neither Arthur or Mary have the tools or resources to enter a healthy, committed relationship as they're both dependent on something else. Even Mary's brother, Jamie, is an example of the fact that her father fostered an environment that creates insecure and indecisive individuals. Jamie falls victim to a cult for a brief time, and commonly people who are vulnerable, lack purpose, lack self-confidence, become quite typical cult victims all of which are traits that are consequences of being raised with an emotionally abusive parent. Furthermore, growing up with an abusive parent can create an intense sibling bond, wherein the older sibling especially becomes parentified and subsequently quite protective over their younger siblings. Did Mary move to Valentine, or were they there together when Jamie fell in with Chelonia? I wonder. Either way, this is a cult that does, like, rituals wherein they throw themselves off a cliff for their turtle god, so I get the concern. If my brother called me up and said, I'm joining the Church of Scientology, I, I would be a little concerned. Would I be so concerned that I would call up my ex, who I haven't spoken to in years because he's a known gang member with a warrant out for his arrest that my family heavily disapproved of to the point that I backed out of an engagement if I knew he was the only one who could help my brother not lose everything to the Church of Scientology? I, I mean, yeah, probably. In my videos, I've made a bit of a point of trying not to talk about broadly held attitudes within the fan community and really just focus on my own feelings and findings. If you want to hear me complain about fan attitudes, I do enough of that on TikTok. But I find it hard to do that where Mary Linton is concerned, I'll be frank. A lot of the consideration and character analysis and research I do stems pretty directly from the way I see people in the community discuss Mary Linton. And honestly, that extends to Abigail as well. So welcome to my rapid fire Mary Linton apologist era. Number one, Mary uses Arthur. Guys, I am chronically friendless, and even I know that it's pretty common to help your friends when they ask for help. Even if you've fallen out or you're not in touch, as is pretty common in a lot of adult relationships, which I guess maybe some of us just aren't there yet, which is okay. Oftentimes it's said that Mary Linton disagrees with Arthur's lifestyle until it's personally convenient for her, but I also don't see that. Mary doesn't ask Arthur to break the law on her behalf for some hapless reason because she wants to see him. In fact, she asks Arthur expressly not to break the law when she asks him to save her brother from a cult or stop her father from gambling away their entire life savings, including personal family heirlooms. It feels as though what Mary's asking for help with is often downplayed, and her request is often mischaracterized. This is also one of the few quest lines where Arthur has any real agency in it. He's given a choice whether he wants to help her or not, and the only reason that Mary would hold anything against him is if he outright refuses to answer, like I mentioned before. If Arthur says no, however, Mary tells him she understands and apologizes for reaching out. She only calls when she needs something. I feel the need to take a moment to just consider how video game objectives work, and also how relationship dynamics work. Like mentioned before, this is the first time Mary's contacted Arthur since they split and I don't know why else she would reach out unless she felt she needed to. But also, like, on a fundamental level, it's very rare that Arthur walks away from an interaction without, like, a task to complete. He's asked for favors and dortered around the whole time. Like, that's... the game. Sometimes it feels like we get so caught up in only seeing things from Arthur's perspective that we can overlook the ways in which he also contributed to the breakdown of that relationship. Mary's missteps in their correspondence, like bringing up her long-held feelings for Arthur in a way to persuade him, are often hyper-focused on, while Arthur will scream at her on a public sidewalk, and that's often overlooked. Mary is not perfect, obviously, but it seems silly to expect that of her, given her upbringing and in comparison to Arthur Morgan, who was wanted for $5,000 across several states. Okay, thank you for letting me get that off my chest. I'm defensive of a lot of characters in this franchise. <laughs> Something I really love about Red Dead is how many different perspectives we get and how many ways we can explore how desperation looks on a person. It's a story that brings out so many emotions in so many people, and it's hard not to let feelings and reactions to the behaviors and actions of characters not cloud our ability to see their perspectives especially when those characters aren't the protagonist, or they even cause strife for the protagonist. In the moments where Arthur brings Jamie Gillis back to Mary and they have a train to catch, she'll look back at him, freeze, and then go, oh, you'll never change. The first time I heard this, I was like, damn, <laughs> I just helped you. But then I took a moment and I realized just how similar this feels to their second send off in Saint Denis. The way she'll look at him so reverently for a moment, but then you can see the disappointment on her face, and I think I realized 
It feels like she's about to ask him to come with her, in Valentine, but she thinks better of it in that moment. She stops and saves herself the disappointment, because even if he said yes, I think she's well aware that he probably wouldn't live a happy life away from the gang. Mary knows he won't change that easily, and we know that too. It took Arthur being told he's going to die for him to change. Maybe it's less so being said to Arthur, and more to herself. Unfortunately, Arthur also got to hear it, so. <laughs> but she can't help herself in saint -Denis. She got a taste in Valentine, and while I do think not wanting your father to gamble away his funds, including your inheritance, is not an unreasonable thing to ask for help with, I think it's also a distinctly less urgent reason. Which is why I think it's probably easier to say no to this request, and I also think it's likely that a big part of the reason she asked for Arthur's help is simply because she wanted to see him again. She grows bolder, asks him to spend time with her when all is said and done, and against her better judgment, she asks him to run away this time around. And of course, he says no, but she waits for him. Uh, until he robs the National Lemoyne Bank. I think the ship has finally sailed at this point. Mary's final letter means so much to me. I will help Mary every single time I play solely for that letter. It's this letter that really exposes Mary's heart, and you realize that she's a hopeless romantic, just like Arthur. She misses Arthur, and she always will, and what makes it sad is he's not the one that got away. He's the one that she was forced to let go. She clung to this love that she knew would go nowhere, even if Arthur had agreed to come with her in Saint Denis. It was only a matter of time before he found his way back to this life. He's wrestling with giants, wrestling with the expectations of those who saved him, those who rely on him, wrestling with the expectations he has for himself, wrestling with what he knows and what he wants. Mary knows there is an escape from this life. It's too late for any of them. Arthur knows that, and John will come to learn that. Despite all the cosmic doom that these characters are seeped in, there's a moment of reprieve where Mary and Arthur's love gets to live on in a form in Abigail and John. Mary and Abigail are both women who fell for a couple of fixer-upper situations, and I often wonder what Arthur was like when he first met Mary, when he was closer to John's age. Was he disorganized? Did he also struggle with priorities? Did he repress his thoughts and feelings to the point of frustration? Was Mary too idealistic in her belief of what could be that she couldn't really see what was? Abigail is offered far less freedom. Being a mother and having never really been a society lady, it's easier to stick it out. Where would she go? Where would she take Jack? At some point, it becomes apparent that a major contributor to the success of John and Abigail's relationship is the fact that they didn't have any other options, while Mary Linton did. Abigail's life and the circumstances surrounding it bid her no other option than to grovel for years at the feet of a man who has abandoned her in circumstances that he helped create. Would John have been Abigail's first choice? Would Abigail have been John's? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Would Mary have been Arthur's first choice? Would Arthur have been Mary's? Maybe. But it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Mary wouldn't abandon her family and forsake her father, even if he never really had her best interest at heart. Just as Arthur won't abandon his family and forsake Dutch. They're two halves of a whole that will never be. Even though parts of their love live on in John and Abigail, their expiration date is more imminent than one might like. There was no fighting chance for any of them. They lack the fundamentals to create people who would function in society or function in relationships. Arthur and John have such comparable experiences, but where they differ splits the course of their destiny. But only minutely. All four of these characters intersect with one another in some form or fashion. Whether it's through their lack of parents, or the abuse they faced at their hands, or their commitment to something that ultimately harms them in the end, They've been abandoned, left behind, and forced to survive on their own in so many ways. I understand that what I'm noticing are just like basic literary parallels, and that's how stories work. But I feel like I'm connecting something. I see the whole picture, all right? I see the pi- I've started streaming over on twitch.tv slash pinkygunslingy, so if you want to watch me play games, you can do that. <laughs> also, thank you guys for 10k, that's kind of nuts. Um, I plan to keep on keeping on, and I appreciate the ongoing support. Anyway, that's it, bye.